a little bit of a hard string tug to me. I'm going to read you here. It was kind of a, it's kind of a greeting. Uh, it's from a Karen couple. Karens are people from Burma who lost in the Revolutionary War that they had there and were driven out of the country. And these two people now live in the north of Finland, uh, up in the Arctic Circle. And so, quite a change from the jungles of South Africa up to the north of Finland, a uh, big adjustment. But I've been visiting them since uh, probably five years, uh, once or twice a year. And they've been to the Feast of Tabernacles a couple of times in that period of time but they couldn't get permission to leave the country this year. You know, the supervisors and so forth changed. And so, and so they uh, wrote this message and came in on my computer last night. And it reflects something about their background and so forth. And I, I say they, they were driven out in the revolution in Burma. They lived in a tent, my understanding, 40 years in the nation of Thailand. Finally, uh, the international community decided to dig up these, Burma, these Burmese refugees and send them to different places in the world. And these two, Margaret and Koke, were sent to the north of Finland. It's kind of like uh, the cards are dealt out and you get sent where you get sent. And that's about the only choice you have, either to go or stay in the death room for the rest of your life. They wanted very much to be able to be here with us in the Feast of Tabernacles. And I got this message last night, so I'll read this message to you and um, share the information. Dear Minister, Mr. Lambert, Johnny, and Hazel, you know, they're very deferential in everything that they do, very polite, very deferential, and, and so forth. We do miss you both, not get in touch with you for a long time. Uh, Margaret is the only one really, between the two of them, who speaks English well enough to send a message like this. Did you receive my reply to you that you have asked me about the information of my job which disturbed me for going to the feast? That I wouldn't give her permission to go to the feast because it depends entirely on refugee status and uh, welfare benefits in order to live there and stay alive. Because I do not see nothing message from you, so I do not know when you will visit me again or not yet. Where are you now? Are you both at the Feast of Tabernacles in Estonia or where else? Hope you have a happy Feast of Tabernacles. Longing to hear from you too. We do fine. Hope Johnny will be in good health by the grace of God. Best wishes and much love to you both, Margaret and Coke. Well, they would be here if they if they could. And I know that um, that's very heartfelt. Very, very heartfelt. And uh, so I thought to share that with you personally. I have made a count of people, and I am adding them in as if they are. Because I know that, that it's their intention that they would be. Sermon today, I'll harken back to the first message on open night and uh, ask you to remember this distinction. We are not here on a vacation. We are performing three functions that are different from being on a vacation. One, we are acting as prophets. Just by our presence here, we prophesy about the coming of God's kingdom. We cast this little by comparison shadow 
of that which is to come. Paul talks about that in Colossians 2.16. That's the first distinction. Second one, we are witnesses. Now, it's a big, big uh, difference, we might say, between being a prophet and a witness. Which direction does a prophet look in? Prophets always look forward, right? Pro prophecy is about the future. Witnesses look back. They testify of, about events that have occurred. So those are two things that we're doing here. And the third thing we're doing is preparation. Preparing ourselves to be kings and priests in God's kingdom. And I guess preparation, we might say, if we say that prophecy focuses on the future and witnessing focuses on the past, preparation focuses on the right now. Understanding and getting ourselves ready to fulfill the function that God has in mind for us and to which the whole world will need persons to be able therefore. So those three things. But I want to focus in particular in this sermon <coughs> on prophecy. Prophecy. Prophecy which indicates the coming of God's kingdom and what it's going to be like. Who would call this an expository sermon? There are two basic different types of sermons that I would give. One would be topical. A topical sermon, we would take a topic and we would go back and forth throughout the Bible looking for information about that topic. An expository sermon, in a different way, takes a certain text of the Bible and we cast light, we expose it, we put, we put it under the magnifying glass with a light and work on understanding more perfectly that text in the Bible. So this will be an expository sermon. And the, 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 the section of the Bible that we're going to be looking at and trying to expose by putting the light in the magnifying glass on it is probably a book that most of us don't pay very much attention to. It's the book of Haggai. And it's chapter 2 we'll be looking at. I thought that one of the things that one of the reasons I would give this is because as a church, and I don't just mean the United Church of God, but I mean all of the churches of God, which are valid representatives of God's way, they all need encouragement at this time. We need encouragement because if we go back, you know, 15 years ago, the church was tremendously larger. And we have seen the church decimated, and the church, the church is not the same. And, and, and it's easy to be discouraged over what we have seen. And I guess maybe that is part of the reason why God sent this message from Haggai uh, to the people at the time they were building, rebuilding the temple. They had been there rebuilding the temple for 18 years and they hadn't completed it and it was very apparent to them at that point this temple was not in any way comparable to Solomon's temple and so they were discouraged like we have been discouraged by seeing the church of God go from where we were keeping like 150, we had 150,000 people at one point keeping the Feast of Tabernacles down to the point that now we have maybe 20,000 people keeping the Feast of Tabernacles if we combine all of the branches, twigs, and pieces of the bark and leaves that are laying on the ground and 
total goes up, we won't have that many people. It's not the same as it was before. So we need encouragement. If we, if we have eyes to see, and reading, reading these scriptures in Haggai requires that we have eyes to see what is being said here, if we have the eyes to see it, then God has given us that encouragement here in the book of Haggai. So what I want to do in this uh, message is to encourage you, us, because me too, who should get the most encouragement out of this? I always find that when I give a sermon, probably I'm the one who benefits the most from the sermon because uh, I spent a lot more time on the subject than the people who are sitting out there. And all of you who speak probably understand the same thing. Probably understand the same thing. You get the most out of a sermon when you give it more than anybody else can possibly get. And that's the way it is. So it's to encourage us, especially myself, about the future of God's church and the work of God by exercising one of the reasons that we're here, being prophets. Looking at the prophecy that's contained in the book of Haggai. In order to do that, so we need eyes to see. So one of the things, one of the big things that gives us those eyes to see is a prophetic principle that Paul reveals to us. And this is to always uh, consider prophecies many of them are often, maybe even usually, delivered to us in terms of symbols. Parables also are delivering us messages in terms of symbols. Key to unraveling the mystery that is there is to understand the symbols understand the symbol. Matthew 13 is an example of where Christ spoke all day long to thousands of people standing on the shore and it tells us in Matthew chapter 13 he only spoke in parables and he did it for the purpose of not making his meaning clear to everybody. But his meaning was to be clear only to the people that, that were being, who were having their mind open. So that's maybe the situation as well here with this particular parable. Here's a key, I believe, to understanding this prophecy to us prophets who were here, keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, not a vacation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Whenever we talk about the temple, what is it that we should understand about it as a prophecy? And we used to speak about this a good bit. I haven't heard us speaking about it in a long time. But we used to speak frequently about this. Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Don't you know that you, as we sit here keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, prophets, witnesses, and, and the people being prepared to serve in God's kingdom, don't you know you are the temple of God? You see, when we when we read in Haggai, they're going to be talking about physical temples. <laughs> two different physical temples. But those two physical temples, really, if you're going to look at this as prophecy, which I think you have to, there's no other way to understand this section of Haggai except as prophecy. 
you have to understand it's not a, it's, it's written about the physical temples, but it's not really about the physical temples. It's about the spiritual house of God. I remember uh, the song that we sang, Mr. <coughs> Shipke was up here singing, and the owner was playing, and maybe it's the one I jumped the gun on. Number 16, my shepherd will supply my needs. And then there's a line in there, there's, a, there's part of a verse in there that says, Oh, may thy house be mine abode. I think it goes very well with the fact that we are the temple of God. The temple that's being talked about here is a spiritual temple. And so, understanding the property and applying that principle, sometimes we understand something, but we don't apply it to what we're reading. If we understand it and apply it to what we're reading in Haggai, then I think it makes it, it, makes it very clear. Just to maybe cry in my beer a little bit. <laughs> Thinking about some of the things that I remember from the temple, for I mean from the uh, from the church in the past, and uh, Mr. Mr. Kirchin was in Buffalo, so I'll give you a little bit of information about the church in Buffalo at that time, and a little bit of information about the church in Buffalo today. I remember in the early 90s. There were two congregations, and uh, as well, Penman's from Buffalo. Last year, the Bells from Buffalo. There were two churches of 600 each in Buffalo back around the early 90s. Since that time, 1,200 people were attending in Buffalo. Plus, there were churches all the way from Buffalo to New York City. Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, and down into New York City and across the southern tier in Oregon, uh, Elmira, and one down around Newburgh. And, and, uh, so all of those churches, there, were, there was quite a number of people there. I mean, it's kind of a relatively small number compared to the total population. But presently, from 1,200 people that were in Buffalo, if I count everybody that I can sheet into the totals, I come up with about 100 people who are keeping God's Sabbath and understand the truth of God in the Buffalo area now. So there's this kind of decimation, which we're trying to, we're trying to rebuild. That's a difficult to do the report, though, is this is not just Buffalo. This is consistent throughout the entire church. Uh, I, I think about Scandinavia. We, uh, Hazel and I, have made long trips through Scandinavia, and at most we have visited maybe 15 people. And uh, if Margaret and Cloak if we can she didn't call Margaret and Cloquet as being here at the Feast of Tabernacles, we would have two people coming from Scandinavia. In Estonia, we came in 1997. Uh, we uh, thought, well, this, is, this, this place is ripe for God's truth. And we will start trying to develop it. We started running radio advertisements, uh, doing all kinds of things, translation, publication, and I, I, I had this pie in the sky dream. The Van Hoysa Theater in Tartu, a nice theater where they have stage plays and so forth. Someday we're going to fill that theater with people who are keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Holds about 800 people. And you see how many people there are here from the Sony today. And, uh, 
So, what we can say, and this, this evaluation, it could be discouraged. So where do we turn more encouragement? Let's turn our attention to this fairly obscure verse of Scripture. Haggai. Now, if you don't know where Haggai is in the Bible, I probably wouldn't know it either if I hadn't focused on it a lot since 1996. I discovered this section in Haggai in 1996 when we were keeping the Feast of Tabernacles in Germany. It is one of the last three verses. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and then comes Matthew. It's right at the end of the Old Testament. And Haggai was a prophet writing at that time the end of the age. Or the end of the um, time period that was going to the Bible was the Bible was going to cease to speak. 450 years at the end of this, uh, kind of right at the end of this uh, signal. And it's 450 years after the signature verses in the book of Malachi before Matthew starts to speak and the birth of Christ with the four Gospels is being recorded. 450 years ago. Haggai chapter 2. <clears throat> A very interesting set of scriptures here. The first three verses. Haggai chapter 2 verses 1, 2, and 3. In the seventh month. What month are we in right now, by the way? We are in the seventh month. So it makes it it's kind of relevant because uh, this this month this uh, scripture is a, this account is something that God gave specifically to Haggai and told him to take it to the people in Jerusalem who will read the New Testament. And he did it at a particular time. And it's in the seventh month. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month. 21st day of the seventh month. What event was occurring on the 21st day of the seventh month? The Feast of Tabernacles starts on the 15th day of the seventh month. And it continues for seven days. So it's the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles that God gave this message to Haggai and told him to take it to the people who were rebuilding the temple. Are we the people who were rebuilding the temple? The temple is what? There's a physical temple. But there is a spiritual temple as well. The twenty and the seventh month of the one and twentieth day of the month came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel. Oh, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, the governor of Judah. That's who he was. He's the son of Sheatel and the governor of Judah. And so, Zerubbabel, it was Zerubbabel after whom the new temple that they were constructing was named. Zerubbabel's temple. And Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest and to the residue of the people saying, those who are left at the end of what was a what was a really long and difficult captivity. And he says, This is the this is the message. It starts out with verse three, and it asks a question. The message is sort of captured in this question. Who is left among you that saw this house in its first glory in its first glory what's that referring to? 
who is left that saw this house? They're reconstructing the temple. What was the first house? Solomon's temple. And what was Solomon's temple like? Today, it's still regarded as the most magnificent building ever built in terms of all of the accoutrements that went in it, in terms of all of the finances that went into it, the amount of the gold and the silver that went into that, the olive wood, and all of the things that David had brought from all around the world there and left for Solomon to construct after his death. It was, most, it was really a glorious temple. Who is left that saw this house in its first glory? And how do you see it now? Well, what happened? Nebuchadnezzar came in and conquered uh, the Jews in Jerusalem. He tore down the temple. He took out all of the artifacts from the temple and carried them away in the battle. And there was a pile of ashes and stones left there where that temple has been, had been. And it had been probably 80 years. I'd have to go back and research that a little bit now if we even could really get a good definitive answer since that temple had been destroyed. And here's the question. Who is, left, who is left among you that saw that house in its first glory? Look and think about the true house of God, the spiritual house of God. Who saw the first house in its glory? And I'm not talking about it. We'll get to it. I'm not talking about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I'm not talking about 1990. But the first house in its glory. Who is left among you that saw this house in its first glory? How do you see it now? Is it in your eyes by comparison as nothing? You know, here they've been working for 18 years now. And again, this is a physical, spiritual analogy. They were working 18 years to rebuild that temple. And as of, even after those 18 years, they weren't near to completion. And the temple was regarded as nothing. It looked like it wasn't, it, wasn't any, it wasn't going to be. It didn't have the capability to be the light that Solomon, the temple that Solomon had. Dropping down to verse 9. Here's the promise of God. And this promise has to be pointed not at the physical house of God. But it has to be pointed at the spiritual house of God. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, well, this is kingdom of God language, isn't it? In this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. So that's where I get the title for the sermon, The Glory of the Latter House. Haggai was a prophet during the time of the restoration of the temple, the rebel dust temple. Nebuchadnezzar had conquered the Jews, destroyed Solomon's temple, and was and the king and, and his family were taken away to uh, Babylon, and the king was put to death, his sons were put to death, the promises of God, some people lost hope as a result of the fact because God had promised that there would always be a descendant of David to sit on the throne. And here was, visibly at least, the descendants of David all being taken back to Babylon and crushed. There were no descendants to sit on the throne. Yes, there was. 
There was. There was a daughter, and uh, Jeremiah took that daughter to Ireland and established the throne in Ireland. That's another story. The people who were carried away captive were given a decree by the Persian emperor, Cyrus, the king of Persia, issued a decree allowing the Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Zerubbabel was appointed the governor of the province. Approximately 50,000 Jews returned in 538 and started to rebuild the temple. It took them two years to build the foundation. That was that was pretty that was pretty good time. They to, to put the foundation in in two years, and they they felt pretty good about it. But 16 years later, they had no put together the building. So Haggai is told to say, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, saying, who is left among you that saw this first house in its glory? Is it now in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Well, there were apparently a few people in that 50,000 who went back who had seen Solomon's temple. And those people, those few people who had seen Solomon's temple and seen what a glorious building it was are now looking at what they were doing and probably shaking their head. Shaking their head. Down in verse 9, this promise from God. And I say it's a promise. I say it is a promise to you and I about the spiritual house of God, not about a physical temple that was being rebuilt because we are the ones who are like those 50,000 people who returned. We are to rebuild the house of God, God's church. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than of the former house, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace. Just cover a few things about the glory of Solomon's temple. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But you can find it in 1 Kings chapter 6. And I'll read a few things here to you out of 1 Kings chapter 6 and try to go just through it very rapidly. The oracle, verse 19, and the comparison is invited. So we're comparing the former house to the latter house. The oracle he prepared in the house within to set there the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And the ark of the covenant was in that temple. And the center place and uh, was stored there. The oracle in the forepart was 20 cubits in length and 20 cubits in breadth, 20 cubits in height, gave dimensions. Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold. Now, if you look at those dimensions and you said he overlaid all of that with pure gold. A lot of gold. And the whole altar that was by the oracle, he overlaid it with gold. Within the oracle, he made two caravan of olive uh, trees, each 10 cubits high. That 10 cubits is 15 feet or 5 meters, I guess we would say, high. And 5 cubits was the one wing of the carob, and 5 cubits the other wing of the carob. From the other most part, one wing to the other most part of the other most ten cubits. Big. The height of one carob was ten cubits, and so it was to the other carob as well. Carabins within the inner house stretched the wings of the carabin so that the wings of one touched the one wall and the wing of the other touched the other wall. And he overlaid the carabin. 
He carved all the walls of the house round about it with carved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers within and without the floor of the house, just the floor now, he overlaid with gold. Within and without. So that gives you some of the things. Solomon's temple, and this is just some of the maybe, maybe things that we would take particular note of. Solomon's temple was a most glorious temple. And then you think, go back and think of the promise that God made. And we're looking at this not only as uh, a physical temple that Solomon built and another physical temple that Zerubbabel built, but we're looking at it as the spiritual house of God. And a comparison to the physical things that were being talked about here versus the coming of God's kingdom. Here's my comparison to Revelation's temple. Haggai chapter 2 and 3 <clears throat> pretty much says it all. Who is left among you that saw this house in his first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not? And there must have been some old people, maybe as old as I am, probably even a little bit older. Is it not in your eyes, by comparison, as nothing? They were, we've been working on it for 18 years, and they hadn't completed it. And I don't know how many more years it would be before they did complete it. But after all of that labor and effort that they put in, they just had to sigh and say, it is as nothing compared to Solomon's stuff. And there were people there that had seen Solomon's temple, apparently. But the promise was, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former house, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And this is, uh, this is a beginning point where you see this cannot be a a prophecy about a physical structure just cannot be because number one there's never been another building built like Solomon's temple and here it is saying in verse 6 let's read verses 6 through 8 thus says the Lord of hosts yet once it is a little while we look at it more than a little while, but you know, that's what it's, it's a little while, not going to happen right now, but in a little while, I will shake the heavens. The earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations. And the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house. What house? God's true temple. I will fill this house, God's true temple, with glory. It didn't happen to be right below the temple, says the Lord of hosts. Silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. This promise must of necessity be a prophecy. Now I want to establish, as I told you earlier in the message, I, want, I, would, I would establish the first house and the glory of that first house. Let's read a little bit about the early New Testament church. That was, we could say, the first house that God established. Acts chapter 2. Here's what that house, that true house, that spiritual house, was like in its glory and in its magnificence. Verse 1 of chapter 2 in the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. 
Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. God's Holy Spirit was in a very ostentatious way visible to everybody at that time in that house, in that temple. And there appeared unto them cloven tongue. This is a you know, physical appearance of God's Holy Spirit appearing. And what a magnificent thing that was by comparison. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled. In this first house of God, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them up utterance. Now today, he said, who is left among you that saw this house in its first order? Well, we didn't see it, but we read about it. Every one of us who reads in the book of Acts reads about what this house, this temple was like at that time. This first temple of God. Paul says, we are that temple. The church is, is the temple of God. The first one is the one right after the death of Christ. Fifty days later, the day of Pentecost was fully come. So that's uh, the appearance of God's Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit was everywhere in that temple. We don't see anything like that today. By comparison, what we see, we see small manifestations of God's Holy Spirit, but we don't see this kind of powerful, overwhelming, visible manifestation of God's Holy Spirit. We don't see it. It's there to a limited degree by comparison. In our eyes, that comparison seems to be as maybe nothing. What about conversions? You know, my, my pie in the sky dream about having 800 people at the Feast of Tabernacles in Tartu in the Van Boisa Theater. A couple of the Estonians know where the Van Boisa Theater is and know it's a very nice building. I thought we've seen the capacity is 800. We'll shoot for having 800 people there and having the Feast of Tabernacles there. Well, didn't happen. But there were many conversions. You said we haven't had many conversions. On Acts 2, verse 41, we read about those conversions. This is the glory of the former house. Comparatively speaking, like Solomon's temple. They that gladly received the word in one day, under the power of God's Holy Spirit, they that received the word were baptized. And that very same day, 3,000 people were added to the church. 3,000 people. That's the glory of the former house. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in that verse 48. Who was left among you that saw that house in its first glory? Miracles of healing. What about the miracles of healing that were going on at that time? We don't see those miracles of healing going on today when we have healings, which we do have. And they're far more subdued not so visible to all of the world as they were here at that time in this first house. Acts chapter 5, jumping forward here, a few chapters, by the hands, it says of the, the apostles, were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord.
and Solomon's porch. And all the rest, no man dared to join himself to them, but the people magnified them. Believers were added more to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch they brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow something. And just the shadow of Peter going over some of these people would cause them to be healed. There came also a multitude out of the city round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. These were not people that were necessarily committed to God's way of life. They were just being brought and this physical healing was accomplished in them. The same as it had been when, when Christ was alive. You know, Christ didn't just heal His disciples. He healed a lot of people that were, were not followers of His at all. We find lots of accounts to that. And here it is, came a multitude out of the city roundabout to Jerusalem and they all brought their sick friends with them, which were, and people that were demon possessed, so that were vexing spirits, and they were healed every one. That's the glory of the former true house of God, God's spiritual temple. And I'm convinced he had Solomon's temple built with that glory because he was building a physical prototype of what was going to happen with his true temple, his church. But that isn't all about Haggai. We're still under the expository light here, looking at what Haggai has to say. Haggai gave an What's an imperative? We used to talk about the imperatives in, uh, when we studied English in school, but that was a long time ago. Uh, they haven't, to my knowledge, had Jackson and Mason so much as diagram a single sentence. We used to have to do those things. We sort of hated it, but we did it, and it really has stood me in good stead over the years that I've learned to be able to do that. Imperative is almost like a command. It is a requirement. It is stated as something dogmatically, as something that must be done. So Haggai said, you see that temple over there? It's not anything. It's, it, it's not like the, the glory of the former house. But here's what you do. Now we can speak this to ourselves. This is what we are to be doing. Do the job. Work on completing the temple. Don't worry about the glory. God is going to give the glory. He's promised to do that. He promises to do that. Do it right here in this book of Haggai. Where he said, I know you're discouraged. Do the job. And I'm going to put the glory into this temple. Verse 4 of Haggai 2. Be strong. Be strong. Oh, it rabbi bell, says the Lord. And be strong. Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. And be strong. Call to call the land. Be strong. And work. I take this as something that I focus my attention on from time to time. We all need to be strong and do the work. For I 
am with you, saith the Lord. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains among you, fear not. Parity be well understood for us who are now trying to rebuild that temple today. And we didn't get 800 people in the Van Boys Theater in dark to keep the fish and tabernacles. Instead, we have like 36, 38 people here at Sarabah in a conference room on the fifth floor keeping the feast of tabernacles. We have a responsibility given to us. It's a privilege. It's not just a responsibility. It's really not even a, a responsibility at all. It is a privilege to be able to participate in what God is doing. The imperative has to be to analyze this this section of, of the Bible has to be for us today. Has to be for this, this latter house that God is going to construct. Jesus Christ is going to return to this house and things are going to be changed eternally. The kingdom of God is going to come to be. I entitled this message, The Glory of the Latter House. Why did I do that? In order to understand what the glory of the latter house will be like, first of all, we need to understand what the glory of the former house was like. The glory of the former house was conversion. It was healing. It was God's Holy Spirit. It was all of those things that we see and read about in the book of Acts. Verse 9 of Haggai chapter 2. The glory of the latter house at this age, as we look at the return of Jesus Christ, the glory of this latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former house. Greater than it was in 1528 in those years. That's what God says. It's going to be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. So the conclusion is that this must be an entirely prophetic section having to do with God's church. You are here at the Feast of Tabernacles, not teaching and daycare. You are here performing a prophecy. You are here performing a witness, and you are here preparing yourself to be able to lead in these things in God's kingdom as kings and priests. So let's be encouraged. If this was intended, this scripture in, in uh, Haggai was intended to us to be a, an encouragement to continue the work and to understand what the ultimate outcome is going to be because God eternal has